You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today is Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. It's a whole lot of 20s. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today marks episode 40 of this show. Apparently COVID's not going anywhere, and neither am I. My guests are Jessica Smithers of the Davis Cemetery and Bobby Wiest of Davis Firefighters Local 3494, and we'll get to them in just a few minutes. Davis Media Access is proud to be a community partner for Free Speech Week, October 19th through the 25th, when we're highlighting our projects in youth media, local election and voter education programming, public affairs, and advocacy for local nonprofits, arts, and music. And today, October 20th, is Community Media Day. And you may ask, what is community media? To be clear, it's not commercial media, and it's not federally subsidized public media, such as PBS or NPR. It is nonprofit, hyper-local outlets, like this one here, Davis Media Access. Community media supports local creators, increases conversations around municipal matters, fosters an understanding of local cultures, and shares information that improves our lives. Please show your support for Davis Media Access and help us continue to be able to provide these resources for the residents of Davis and Yolo County. And you can learn more at davismedia.org. Well, that's the fun stuff. Now I'm going to tell you that COVID case numbers crossed some discouraging boundaries in the past week. 40 million cases and over 1 million deaths worldwide. And 8.26 million of those cases are in the United States alone, with about 220 deaths in this country as well. And if you look at those numbers, that means nearly a quarter of the worldwide deaths have been right here in the U.S. of A., And in California, roughly 883,000 cases have been reported and about 17,000 deaths. And, uh, you know, all states, almost all states are dealing with a resurgence right now. Pretty much what the CDC said would happen is happening. Drilling down into those numbers closer to home, as of yesterday, Yolo County's dashboards report over 3,000 cases, 3,073, 56 deaths, and a test positivity rate of 4.85% countywide. Let's see. On Friday, the county announced a new grant program providing assistance to renters who have been impacted by COVID-19. The program is meant to support renters who are at greater greatest risk of displacement due to COVID and a related inability to pay their rent or utilities. Uh, Applicants must be very low income, defined as 60% of the median income for the area or low income, which is 80% of median income with proof of a high rent burden, and who have experienced financial difficulties due to COVID. A one-time payment of up to $4,000 can be dispersed directly to landlords or utilities, Applicants must demonstrate loss of income or increased medical or child care cost or loss of child care itself due to COVID. All right, here's the place to apply. I'm going to read it twice. YCH.CA.gov slash COVID-19 slash 2020.php. YCH.CA.gov slash COVID-19 slash 2020.php. If that fails, go to yolocounty.org and uh, and look for rent assistance there. The fund opened October 16th and remains open until all funds are exhausted. We are going to take a brief moment for music, and we'll be back with our first interview shortly. All right, we are going to talk about cemeteries today, and in particular, the Davis Cemetery District and Arboretum. Each October, the cemetery holds a really wonderful Dia de los Muertos celebration. And can you think of a more fitting setting for our local adaptation of this beautiful celebration of life and death uh, that originated in Mexico, and today it's celebrated all over Central America and here in the U.S.? Despite COVID, the celebration is on in a modified fashion, and we'll hear from Executive Director Jessica Smithers how it's been adapted for this year. We'll also learn about some of the other unique features 
of this surprising local resource. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Autumn. So please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be managing a cemetery. So I joined the cemetery district about two years ago um, as the district superintendent. I left a state position and went um, to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's actually a, a wonderful environment. I never knew, even being a Davis resident, how much our cemetery had to offer. Mm -hmm. so it was really a really great opportunity. I find that people either love cemeteries or they don't. I, I fall into the love category. Um, I actually look for cemeteries when I go traveling because, you know, history and interesting plants and just, you know, just interesting things to see. And uh, I live about two blocks away from the Davis Cemetery, and I've walked through there many times over the years. Something I've always been curious about, why is it called a cemetery district? So we are part of the California Special District Association. So rather than being a county-run cemetery or a city-run, we're considered a California Special District. So that's where the district comes from. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about the history of this place when you manage, um, that you manage. When was it started, for example? So the first Interment on record is actually from uh, 1855. Mm -hmm. However, it was founded as a district in 1922. Okay. Um, I, one of the things I like about old cemeteries is you can see these sometimes huge family plots, and they really help tell the story of a place. You know, who were the families who came here originally, and how did they shape this place as it as it grew, as it came to be. But beyond that, uh, the Davis Cemetery is truly a unique local resource with attributes including an arboretum, uh, two labyrinths, and an art gallery. So let's take those one at a time um, and talk about how they, how they came to be and what they offer. Let's start with the arboretum aspect. Sure. So back in late 2011, the cemetery went through the accreditation process. And in early 2012, we became a level two accredited arboretum, which means we have over 100 tree and woody plant species. The arboretum is unique in that there's not a designated area on our 24 acres, but mm -hmm. rather it's throughout our property. So mm -hmm. it's really a great opportunity for our community members to come out and explore all of the different plant and tree varieties that we have available. Mm -hmm. And that accreditation, we go through a renewal process every five years to keep our accreditation. Great. And so um, I've noticed when you walk through some of the, you know, the specimens, they're, they're labeled. I've noticed that some of them are, are California natives. Is there any particular emphasis on the plants as you add to the collection? So it's definitely picking plants that will will do well in our zone, so zone nine. Mm -hmm. um, we try to really have a variety of both evergreens, um, fall foliage. We try to have a variety of shrubs that will attract uh, bees and other local insects. Uh, and we like to try to coordinate in areas. So you'll notice when you walk through the cemetery, we have certain areas where we're heavier on the variation of tree species, where in more of the historic sections of the cemetery, you'll find our bulb gardens and our scent gardens. Um, so we really try to make it an experience as you walk through. Mm. So I imagine that's the easy place of managing this, the cemetery uh, these days because it's outside, people can social distance. But some of your other um, things, I'm thinking of the art gallery you have on site. I imagine there's been some pretty significant pivots due to COVID. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, so Gallery 1855 is a local gallery that's actually in our administrative building. And it's a place where local artists can come uh, present their artwork on a monthly basis. Unfortunately, because our administrative uh, space is so small that in March we had to make the decision to shut the gallery down, mm -hmm. um, we've made that decision to run through December. Okay. So we're hoping come January that we will be able to start having smaller shows again. We are working with some various local artists to explore the option of having outdoor art shows. Mm -hmm. So that it will still give the artists an environment to present their work. Um, but unfortunately, right now, with all of the social distancing restrictions, it's really not feasible for us to have it open. Right, right. And with fires and winter coming on. So it, it sounds like maybe a, a good thing to pursue sometime in the new year. Um, 
So right there, you mentioned your administration building. There's a, a labyrinth in the grass outside that building that's really cool. I've walked it many times. But I was kind of surprised recently to realize there's a second labyrinth there. Uh, what can you tell us about those? So we actually just finished taking out the second labyrinth. Oh, okay. <laughs> to make way for installing a rose garden and uh, above ground cremation options where the second labyrinth was. But the first labyrinth is located right outside of our administrative building. There's an informational uh, sign at the beginning, and it kind of directs you into you know, how to walk through the labyrinth, what to listen for. So some people, when they come, they think that they're going to find, you know, something similar to a corn maze. That's, that's not what our labyrinth is. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a designated area on the ground that we have a DG pathway through. And it's really a great opportunity to just sit and listen. There's, we have a lot of animals, a lot of birds. Um, so it's, it's a great opportunity to explore outdoors. Right. And I believe it's part of a scavenger hunt you have going on over there. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so what we've done is, in light of COVID, we've really spent some time looking at how can we draw community members, both adults and children, to the cemetery to be able to be outside, get exercise, but maintain that social distance. So one of the things that we just put into place last month is we have a scavenger hunt, and it's a 10 uh, stop scavenger hunt. It's really designed for elementary school aged children. And what you do is you start at the administrative building. We have a five by seven card that will give you a hint for each of the stops. When you find each stop, you'll find a scavenger hunt sign. And those signs are geared to provide a little bit of information about what you're looking at, mm -hmm. as well as some history of the cemetery. And then for adults, we have a history tour. And just to touch on what you said at the beginning of our conversation, the families that are historic to, mm -hmm. to Davis, you know, we sit on mainly old child's uh, ranch farm property. Right. And so we have a 25-stop history tour, and it's the same idea. You start at the administrative building, but it takes you throughout the cemetery, and at each family stop, you'll learn about that specific family and their contributions they've made to the community. Nice. And is are there um, is there a map or brochures or something when you, when you get there? There is. Mm -hmm. We have maps and uh, brochures on our website as well as in our office. Great. All right. Since I uh, preface this talking about the Dia de los Muertos celebration, which I've attended many years and I, and I love, it's usually there's a big uh, community built altar. There's in normal times there's people singing out there. There's various performances. And um, I know that you're still doing it, but I don't know what, what COVID has, uh, how it's changed it. So what's going on for this year? When and what time and all yeah. of that good stuff? So, you know, in the past, you're right, we've had speakers, we've had dancers, we've had uh, pen dulce and hot chocolate that we provide to the community. And this year, we really had to take a close look at how do we keep our community members safe? How mm -hmm. do we keep the health a uh, number one priority, but still offer an event? And so what the district determined um, would be the safest approach this year is starting on Friday, October 30th and running through Sunday, November 1st on our eastern internal roadway. So that's the roadway that ends behind our administration building. We will have an altar that's set up. We're going to do the initial setup and then encourage community members to, to add to that altar. Mm -hmm. We also have been working closely with Melissa Moreno, who has historically been a co-organizer of the event. Right. She worked with me to put together some informational signage. So throughout the roadways, we'll encourage people to stop and park. Um, as they're walking to the altar, they'll see various um, signs that we've created that really talks about the history of Deo de los Muertos. Um, in addition to that, the Plan for Resilience organization, it's a group of local artists uh, that they've been doing a lot of the sidewalk murals mm -hmm. all around town. Um, we have one of their artists that's going to be doing a rather significant uh, mural that will be themed for Day of the Dead. And that's going to be at the end of our roadway. So if you're familiar with the cemetery, mm -hmm. when you go through our back internal roadways, it ends at a large circle. 
So that large circle is where the um, pavement mural will be installed. So that will be there, and that will probably last a few weeks. Yeah. So our our formal event will be those two days, but but it will be there for people to explore after that as well. Great. And I didn't mention this uh, earlier. I, I think most people in town knows where the cemetery I know where the cemetery is. It's big. It's kind of hard to miss, but it's it's roughly uh, it's it, it stretches along Poline and meets at the corner of of Poline and East Eighth in East Davis. And um, did you say it was twenty four acres? It's pretty big. It is. Yeah, it is. And you know where we have a hill kind of in the middle of the cemetery. And what a lot of people don't realize is behind that hill we have another fourteen acres that's completely undeveloped. So it's a great place come out and walk to explore in the springtime it fills with uh california poppies it's absolutely Mm -hmm. beautiful that Um, that brings up a good point though about walking um predating your time you know there used to be a horse ranch out behind it and and it was kind of an informal dog park for a long time before toad hollow dog park was was built um it's probably a good moment to remind people that you're really you can walk dogs through there if they're on leash. Is that correct? Yeah, we encourage people to bring out their animals, mm-hmm. but we do request that they be on a leash at all times. Right, and and I think it brings up the the whole notion of respect. Sort of people, um, you know, aren't sure can I actually go into a cemetery if I'm not visiting a gravesite? Um, is it forbidden to walk across the grass? So, do, do you, what do you tell people about? you know, how to, how to use the cemetery and how to be respectful. We really encourage people to come. The one thing that we recommend is, you know, if, if you notice somebody visiting a grave to make sure that you, you know, keep your voices down if you're with a group, um, no shouting. We prefer no loud music. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, occasionally we'll have to remind people that monuments are, you know, they're just that. They're a monument. They're what you go to to pay respect. They're not to be used as, you know, a bench or something to sit on. Yeah. But what I found is that people are really, you know, they're really courteous and they, they acknowledge that there are certain areas of the cemetery where you see active graves and people generally avoid those areas if they're not visiting or not part of um, one of our self-guided tours. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the back, you know, there's a ton to explore. Great. All right. Uh, lastly, before we finish up, where can people get more info? Um, let me have you give your website and a phone number, please. Yeah, so it's www.daviscemetery.org. That has all the information about our outreach activities as well as our different tours. And then our phone number is 530 756 7807. Great. Jessica, thanks so much for coming on today and for sharing a bit of what you do there. And um, I'm going to take the history tour. I haven't done that. So thank okay. you. Thank you for having me. All right. Take good care. Okay, that was Jessica Smithers, Executive Director of the Davis uh, Cemetery District and Arboretum. Learned a lot of interesting things there today. We're going to take a brief break and I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, our local firefighters aren't heroes just because they fight fires both here in town and out on wildfire strike teams, but because they capitalize on on that, they work all year long to raise money and the profiles of many local causes. Joining me today is Bobby Wiest, president of Davis Firefighters Local 3494. We're going to chat about the annual Fill the Boat Boot Effort and Turkey Basket Program. Hi there, Bobby. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Autumn. Thanks for having me. You bet. (laughs) So normally this this time of year, you know, we're driving around town and it's common sight to see a firefighter standing at a busy intersection holding a boot. And we smile and we stuff money in the boot and we go on and feel good about our day. And uh, let's talk about how it's different this year, all thanks to COVID. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, this year uh, it is different. You know, we've been... um, uh, trying to stay safe and trying to stay healthy so mm-hmm. that we can, you know, continue doing our job. So this year, like many things, we're going to be doing uh, a virtual um, fill the boot. Uh, there's three ways you can donate. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, we won't be out there on the corner. We love doing that because it, it's fun talking to people and, yeah. and seeing them and, and interacting with them. But the three ways you can donate is through Venmo at Davis SFL 3494. 
you can pay by check and make them payable to Davis Firefighters, Local 3494, and mail it to 535th Street, Davis, California, 95616. Or when you go to Dos Coyotes to get yourself a burrito, <laughs> uh, Bobby Coyote always has a boot out at this time of the year at those locations yeah. um, and collects, collects money to, to help us out as well. Um, one of the things I'd also like to, you know, to say is 100% of the money raised goes right back to the community. Absolutely. We don't use it for anything else. Uh, you know, I think last year, um, last, <laughs> luckily the numbers have come down a little bit. Unluckily, the prices have gone up. Hmm, yeah. Uh, it, it cost us, I think we did, uh, we fed 650 families last year. Wow. And it, it was about $18,000. Yeah, so, you're, you're right. I mean, the price of groceries, I think we've all noticed, has skyrocketed during this pandemic. So um, that that's maybe incentive for everyone else. If you know, if you were going to put in 20, put in 25 and, and, and help the firefighters get that goal. Um, 650 families, that's a lot of people you're feeding. Right. Yeah. Let's um. Let's break down the ways to pay that you just talked about. Um. I wanted to. I, I use Venmo all the time. Not everyone knows what it is or uses it. It's an it's an app, um, and you can send and receive money through it. And just so you know, when you go on Venmo, if you just start typing in the search Davis Firefighters, it pops right up. So you don't need to remember the whole FFL three four nine four, and you can easily um donate there and on your facebook page there's a qr code and so what yes. you can do in venmo is you can just hold your phone right up to that facebook page scan the code it'll take you there too uh, it's really easy and then um i'm going to give that address again to the fire station on fifth street 530 fifth street and that's uh, davis california 95616 and uh, let's let's give some props to Bobby Coyote and Dos Coyotes for doing that. I have been in there many years and seen that that boot sitting right. on the counter overflowing. So right, yeah. So and, and if we're since we're doing that, I'd I'd also like to give a you know a shout out. This this has gone on for thirty four years, yeah. and the Davis community has has supported us you know doing this every year. Um, so all of you that have com come through and, and given, you know, drop some money in the booth, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's amazing because some people are giving, you know, the money they have in their ashtray and, mm -hmm. and because that's all they have. Yeah. Um, and every single cent helps. So thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also have like Recology is, you know, used to be Davis Waste Removal, now it's Recology. Mm -hmm. And they are big contributors to us, um, along with uh, Safeway, who helps us out uh, every year. Um, and we have a new one. PG&E this year is going to be uh, helping us with some donations. Well, um, good for them. <laughs> so, yeah, right. I mean, uh, yeah, it, every, every bit helps. And, um, uh, you know, we... Uh, we appreciate it, I, you know, and I know the people do. The, the irony on that last one is not lost. Right. Right. No, I, I, I understand. We've been quite busy this year. Last year. I, I know. I, as you know, I, I follow you all on on uh, right. social media, and it's right. just it's just been an astounding year every year. Of course, we've worked together on fire relief benefits too, and right. every year it just gets worse and worse. So you know, we're just I'm. One among many who are just bowing to you all for the, the job that you do. Thank you so much. And I do have one other question because um, uh, one of my favorite six-year-olds asked me to ask you this question. Will Firefighter Santa ride through the neighborhoods again this year? He is going to do his best. You know, <laughs> it, it, uh, I hope so because I love seeing Santa out there, and I know he, he loves uh, to come here and uh, see all the kids and uh, talk to them and find out what they want. Um, uh, yeah, he's going to do his best to, to, to be here this cool. year. Cool. I, you know, knock, knock on wood, this, uh, uh, everything
thing I'm seeing, you know, the, the numbers are starting to go up again um, and uh, for COVID. And yep. Hopefully, hopefully we, you know, we can get people to uh, keep wearing their masks. I know it's been a long time. Everybody's frustrated and everybody's tired of this thing. But, uh, you know, for your kids, for your grandparents, for your parents, uh, you got to wear the mask. Yeah. That's good advice, and uh, I want to thank you for spending a few minutes with me today to talk about this, and want to encourage everyone to, you know, do what you can to help the firefighters, local 3494, do what they do every year and feed a whole bunch of hungry families a good holiday meal. Thanks so much, Bobby. Oh, thank you. All right, take good care. Bye-bye. All right, uh, thanks for tuning in to the COVID-19 Community Report. I'm going to sign off till next week. I'm going to tell you our show then will be a little bit different. I'll be joined by five local faith leaders who approach me because they'd like to talk about community and anxiety.